riding down the Harland Highway. All right, hold tight on the Harland Highway show. Harland Williams. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, now, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right, I say. Here we go. You are on the Harland Highway podcast. The only place you really need or want to be. And uh, what a show we have for you today. We're going to be talking about all kinds of groovalicious things. Um, and uh, I don't use the word groovalicious lightly. I rarely pull it out. Uh, but today is groovalicious. What can I say? I, I want to start with uh, nature shows. I think we all love nature, don't we? We we all love the critters, ladies and gentlemen. We all love the kooky little critters crawling around in the bushes and out on the plains and up in the trees and in the sky. I think we all love the kooky little critters. I know I do. I, I love me nature. And it's one of, one of the things that I, is my go-to when I'm watching TV. I probably watch more nature shows than I watch anything else. Like I'll watch a documentary about an anteater before I'll watch an episode of Breaking Bad. I'd rather see an anteater stick its five-foot tongue into a termite mound and suck those little bald, wood-eating freaks out of the ground (laughs) before watching a show about a school teacher who's become a crystal meth dealer and hangs out in a trailer in his underpants. Okay, uh, sue me. I like the real world a little better. Although, sadly, crystal meth dealers are part of the real world. But here's where the rub begins with the nature shows. And, you know, I love seeing a nature show, especially in Africa, you know, where you see the, 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 the herds traipsing across the Great Plains and you see a pride of lions walking through the, the golden grass or some, some zebras down by, a, you know, a, a marsh drinking some wawa with their kooky barcode striped fur. By the way, wouldn't you love to just grab a zebra and run it over a a scanner at a Walmart? Just to see what those things are worth. I mean, they're, they're living, walking barcodes. They've got all the stripes, and I would just love to just grab a baby zebra and beep, 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 you know, see what... This zebra is on sale, $49.95. Beep, beep, beep. Or just drag a zebra into bed, bath, and beyond. And can you get the scanner gun? Beep, beep. This zebra is on sale, $12.99. Well, this zebra was a lot cheaper than the Walmart zebra. Um, But yeah, just a running barcode. But uh, I'm straying off a topic here. What I'm, what I'm getting at is um, I, I love seeing animals, beautiful animals in their natural setting. The, the natural surrounding, their environment, where, where they were, where nature intended them to be, right? Where good God in heaven wanted them to be. He wanted mountain goats on the side of a mountain, He wanted wildebeest and zebra roaming the Great Plains. He wanted wanted, uh, hummingbirds humming in front of a tubular-looking plant to suck the nectar out. And so here I am watching these nature shows, and I'm noticing more and more and more the encroachment of us, us human beings, the homo sapiens, you know, you know the, the, the species that ruins it for all the other species, the, the parasites on the planet. You know, outside of the beaver altering uh, geographical landscape and maybe ants, I don't know that there's any other living organism that destroys the environment more than us. 
and we do it. What's even worse is we do it and we are aware that we're doing it. Any other creature in nature is naive to the fact when a, when a beaver builds a dam and, and floods a forest or a plain, it's just doing it out of instinct. It needs to deepen the water so it can have a place to survive and thrive and build its lodge, etc. But us humans, pfft, oh, let's cut down the redwood forest, the giant redwoods. Yeah, oh, we cut them all down. Let's save uh, 12 acres of them just to say we didn't totally uh, decimate the whole species. Yeah, let's uh, slash and burn the... Uh, the tropical rainforests of the Amazon, but uh, we'll leave a few uh, national parks just so we can tell our children we didn't wipe out everything. But it's kind of gross, and, and this, I got a freaking hair in my eye. Oh, oh, oh. I don't know. I learned that in beauty school. Never just like blatantly pull a hair from your eye. I always do it with elegance, like, oh, oh. Excuse me. Oh. And like do the bobblehead thing. I didn't go to elegant school. I just made that part up. There was a freaking hair in my eye. But I'm on camera, so I, I gotta I gotta somehow parlay it into a comedy moment. I just can't like start ripping hair from my eye like I'm the girl from the ring crawling out of the well. <laughs> you know. So I had to embellish the whole thing and, oh, I go to beauty school and this is how they told us to drape the hair back. It's just, you know, I got to think about these things when I'm on camera doing the Harlan Highway podcast. Everything is caught on camera, so I have to be ready for it. I have to be prepared. I have to be professional. So anyways... I'm, I'm loving my nature shows, but I've noticed more and more and more, and not only on nature shows, but on little um, snippets on, on uh, TikTok and, and uh, uh, Instagram when you watch the little, uh, the little film clips. I'm starting to notice it's like there's a beautiful herd of giraffe walking by. You know, there's seven or eight, nine giraffe in a herd with their, you know, their elegant, like kind of slow motion you know, just the way they kind of stroll around, looking around at everything because their their faces are elevated like higher than a condo. And I'll be looking, I go, isn't that beautiful? Look at look at their bodies just undulating across the plains. And I'm like, wait a minute, what what's that in the background? Are those high rises back there just just slightly out of focus in the background? I think I see like a condo. I think I see like a gated community back there. And then I'll be seeing like a herd of wildebeest going by. You know, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah. you know, they make all the grunting noises. And I'm like, wait, is that is that a crane? Is that a construction crane? Just kind of just off in the distance there. I'm seeing, hold on, hold on. Look at that pride of lions. Look at them stalking through the grass, hunting out in the plains right underneath those power lines. What the hell? Yeah, this is what I'm getting perturbed about. I'm starting to see, I think they're running out of pure wild virgin space for these animals. Human beings were exploding our population and we're encroaching on the animal's terrain. And so it's becoming harder and harder to just see an animal in the purity of nature without some kind of hint of humankind. And it's really not making me happen now. I'm going to tell you that, and I'm going to tell you in a Cajun voice, it really not making me happen now. And then here's the other one. I do not want to see a lion hunting a giraffe or a wild buffalo and I get drawn into the chase and I see the running and the stalking and the claws are out and he's diving on the things back and I'm going, wait a second. Is that lion got a choke chain on? Is that thing wearing a leather necklace? 
What was it doing S and M last night over in the Pride? Did they have like a bondage night over with uh, Sumba and Gimba or whatever the Lion King names are? Yeah, some of these lions now in the nature shows will actually they have the balls to show wild lions out in the wild, and they've got like a radio collar on. Apparently, they'd been uh, tranquilized and bagged, and uh, you know now they're tracking them. So now it's like uh, the purity of nature, the wildness, the king of the beasts, the most savage of all animals. Here he comes, claws out, six-inch fangs, ah, and I'm sporting a beautiful Dolce & Gabbana leather necklace. How do you like it? Before we eat, would anyone like to comment on my, my wonderful leather Necklace, which, by the way, has some kind of radio contraption in it. Some, yes, I'm a very modern lion. I, I have uh, electronics around my neck while I gorge on the stomach of a Cape buffalo. I mean, what the hell is this? It, this is like taking you out of the picture, man. It's a nature show. We're not supposed to be seeing hints of humans and technology. And here's another thing. I think the guys who shoot these nature shows are getting lazy because it used to be you'd just see them in the wild, out on the grass, out on the rocks, out on a perch, up in a tree. Now half the the damn nature shows I see, I swear to God, you'll see like a tiger walking down a dirt road. You can see the two two lanes where the the tire treads are. It'll be a full-on dirt road with a tuft of grass down the middle. And here's like the tiger just walking down the road. Okay. Yeah, gee, I really really feel like like I'm in the wild when I see a a Bengal tiger walking down, uh, you know, Jefferson Boulevard over there. I mean, it's it's just it it just takes you right out of it, man. And it's like they're starting to not care. And, and now they're, they're, they're doing all these shots where sometimes I'll see lions and elephants and, and uh, rhinoceroses like out on a paved road with lines going down the middle. And cars are just going around them the same way we'd go around a squirrel here in North America. Oh, there's a 17-ton rare white rhinoceros. There's only three left. Eh, eh, get the hell out of the way. I'm trying to get to McDonald's. I got to feed my kids, you fat fuck. Eh, eh, come on, you endangered son of a whore. Why don't you go die with the rest of your buddies so I can get to the mall? Eh, eh. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see these wild animals. You'll see, you'll see a Yellowstone. You'll see a giant buffalo, you know, walking, uh, having a head-on confrontation with a with a station wagon. You'll see a grizzly bear looking in the window of a of a, a minivan. I'm just, what the hell's happened to our nature? It's just, it's not cool. And in some instances, I've even seen nature shows where the animals are climbing up on top of the vehicles. There's, there's a few nature clips where you see a bunch of cheetahs just jump right on top and be, oh, hey, how you doing? What's going on? It's shady up here. I think we'll hang out up here on your Land Rover if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. And uh, once we're fully rested, uh, would you mind turning on the air conditioner? We're hot. We just chased a gazelle. It didn't go well. We didn't catch it. But uh, we're resting up for the next hunt. And, uh, yeah, if you could just turn those vents and let that air conditioning blast all over me and my brother and sister before we start running again at 90 miles an hour to take down a baby zebra. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's... It's volatile. It's 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 in, I'm incensed about it. I want my nature to be pure, man. And 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 what are the animals thinking? What's going on in their heads? You know, think about it. They only know organic nature. They know trees and rocks and the wind and the sun and the rain and the land. And then all of a sudden. Here's a Dodge minivan. And here's a 
here's a Jeep Land Rover, and here's a, here's a Greyhound bus. And suddenly they go from the organic world, the natural world, to here's this giant metal object that's revving, that's making noise. It's like, you know, the engine's running and the air conditioning's running and maybe the radio's playing and the lights are coming on and this thing's moving around and it's it's changing gears and it's... I mean, what are they supposed to think? Did you ever see that? That uh, That's like us if, if you saw that movie, The War of the Worlds, the Steven Spielberg movie with Tom Cruise. I don't know if you remember the very beginning scene where they first see the monsters and Tom Cruise is in his neighborhood and he's, he's going to pick up his car and all of a sudden the, the, the concrete starts buckling. It's like... Vroom, vroom, and all of a sudden up from out under the ground in the middle of the street, this giant silver octopus looking thing with with big a big silver head and long spindly legs and great big lights on its face and it it rises up and they're all looking at it and then all of a sudden it goes and they're all like everyone goes silent it's like and then it starts looking at them all and they're just like what the hell is this what the hell is this big, shiny, metallic thing making noise with lights on it? And don't you think that's what we've done to nature? Here's these critters that are they're living in the birds and the trees and the bushes and the grass. And all of a sudden, here comes a, a Ford Tundra around the corner. With the lights on and the engine. What are they thinking? Like the, we've created a war of the worlds for for these animals, and oh, I don't know, man. Even even the guys who shoot these documentaries are, are I think are are getting lazy too. That they're stopping to care about the purity of the nature they're filming. And I watched this one uh, nature show. It was, it was absolutely spectacular. It was really great. It was about African wild dogs. And if you don't know what those are, they're, they're, like, they're like a species of wild dog. And they, they, they work in very intricate packs and they communicate with chirps and barks and growls. And, and, and they're very organized and they, they hunt. And they, they, there's like 30 of them in a pack. And then the babies and the puppies and... And it's an intricate uh, little uh, hierarchy in these packs because every every animal in the pack has its place, has its its order, and uh, and it's the way that they make it function. They make it work, and there, there's kind of like rules, and all the animals kind of know their place within the pack, and so. Here's this documentary, I think it was like an hour long, and somehow they're following these dogs, and they got cameras tracking, like almost at their shoulders, they're walking. I'm like, this this is amazing. How did they get this footage? How how many nights did they have to crawl on their bellies through the jungle to, to get this incredible footage? And then at the end of the documentary, the, 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 like five minutes of the end, it goes, please stick around to see how we made this wonderful documentary. And then the nature guys come on and they're like, well, lucky for us, the dogs just happened to be near a road. And so we were able to drive along the road the whole, the whole t- 24 days that we tracked the animals and it sure made our life easy. We were able to drive right along with the, the wild, 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 oh, so wild dogs that live beside a road. And I was just crushed. I was like, come on. Really? This is how you capture? Did you have to show me? Did you have to show me? Here I was, this illusion that you were out in the middle of nowhere and you trekked through through Africa and you, you had to battle off lions and tigers and werewolves and mongoose and who knows what else. And the whole time you're just riding along, sitting on the side of a road. 
And that this is this is the point that I'm coming to, man. It's it's like not only are we encroaching on the animal's territory, but the animals in turn are starting to get used are starting to get used to our our imposing on them. And they're starting to become familiar and dare I say comfortable with all this human crap around. And it's just not a good mix. It's not a good mix. Uh, uh, you know, there's people that could argue and go, well, it, it's great that we can all assimilate and uh, man can live with nature and nature can live with man. No, we're forcing nature to live with us. It's not natural for animals, wild animals, to be rubbing up against cars and trucks and buses and and creeping through people's backyards and looking for prey and food in people's garbages and and hunting their domestic pets. I'm sorry, lions and tigers weren't meant to hunt chihuahuas and Siamese cats in the middle of the night, okay? They were meant to rough it and try and take down a Cape buffalo or a giraffe or something, something that could fight back. I mean, that's another thing. How many of these videos have you seen on, on YouTube where you, you see a, a full-grown, uh, you know, leopard creeping through a suburban neighborhood and uh, going to town on a poodle? Holy God. Just uh, there's something not right happening here. And, and uh, you know how animals are. Animals uh, basically have babies and they train the babies. They stay with the babies and and show them how to function and show them where they can go and where they can find water and where they can find shelter and where they can find food. And, and, And animal behavior is passed on through the generations. So, uh, yeah, you know, how, how long is it till, uh, you move into a neighborhood and you buy a house and you look out the window and you go, uh, honey, is it just me or is, is there a family of hyenas living next door to us? Look, do you see them on the lounge chairs up by the pool that, right? The hair and the spots and one of them looks like he's eating a zebra's leg. Oh my God. Oh my God, where's the kids? Where are the kids? 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 Oh my God, where's the kids? I mean, it's uh, it's not pretty. It's not a pretty look. Oh, the sweet bubbly. The sweet, the sweet bubbles, the volcanic bubbles of the 7-Up gurgling down me throat like a parade of air wrapped up in silicone eyeliner grease. Don't even know what that meant. Was trying to be poetic, trying to keep the flow going, and sometimes I just have to let the words roll. How else am I going to retain your attention? Oh, yes, I know. Fresh beef. Bubbles and beef. And that's the way we do it here on the Harland Highway. But now let's go to a next level of nature show. This this is where we're at now where, where I'm even more riled up. So now they've got these versions of nature shows where it's uh, it's like dinosaur nature shows. They've got these dinosaur nature shows that they do, and they're CGI and Apple and uh, the BBC have a new one out. I forget what it's called, when prehistoric monsters ruled the earth or something. And basically what they've done is they've filmed some beautiful natural footage of the real world, you know, the Amazon River and mountain ranges and Great Plains and all this stuff. And they've CGI'd in dinosaurs and this is nothing new we've seen this before but but up until now the cgi dinosaurs looked a little bit off you know what i mean like when they walked it's like it looked lord like they were they were missing the ground or there was a space between their feet and the earth a little bit or they they kind of looked like they were doing the robot dance at a disco 
Hi, I'm a Stegosaurus. Do 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 bum 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 ba da bum. You know, crack that whip. Ding 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 ding. Give the Brontosaurus a slap. Ding 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 ding. We can whip it. Ding 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 ding. You know, the the CGI was a little bit off, is where I'm going with this. And uh, now, <laughs> whoa. You got check out this new series. The CGI is more real than real. Okay, I'm watching this show, and by the way, the the footage they've shot is with like the best cameras you can buy. So so the natural rivers and and the landscapes they're shooting, it's like breathtakingly stunning. You're like, wow, look at that! And then all of a sudden, a CGI Dilopodon wanders in, and you're like. You, you just go to the next level of reality. You're like, wait wait a minute. Look at the detail on that thing. Look, look at the skin and the creases and the wrinkles and the, the divots. And you're just like, that, that thing's more real than real is real. And all of a sudden, I'm kind of like, wait, I, I, I want to go there. How do I get to that place where things look more real than here where it's real? What, what's happening? I mean, it is, it is incredibly real, is what I'm trying to say. And it's almost mind-blowing, even to the point where they got little CGI flies on the dinosaur skin and dust and little, little hairs coming up, hairs that if they turn the right way into the, the sunlight, you can see little really finite hairs on the dinosaur's skin. It's, it's just unbelievable. And the eyes, it's almost like you can see the liquid running over the eyes and the, the shading and the toning. It, it's, it's absolutely a masterpiece. But it's created uh, th- this fake reality that looks more real than where we are. And, and so what they've done is they've kind of embellished history and they've decided to make a nature show where they talk about the dinosaurs as if they're really here or we're really there filming them. And it's that old British guy, that David Attenborough guy. You know, the guy, his face looks like it's, it's made of wax and he's been in a hot room too long and it's, it's just starting to drip. And he's doing the commentating. I mean, this guy could talk about anything and you'd just be like, really? I mean, he could be like, Today, I pulled some jello out of the fridge. It wiggled, it wibbled, it wobbled, and then I put some whipped cream on the jello. I brought it to my mouth. It jiggled and wiggled and jiggled and joggled, and I put it in my mouth, and I ate the jello. I mean, you know this guy, right? This, this David Richard Attenborough guy or whoever he is? And so now he's on there and they've, they've created like this animation of these dinosaurs. And I guess they kind of have decided to fill in the blanks. Like, and I'm not kidding here. There, there's one scene where, where a Tyrannosaurus Rex mother is with her like six pups or baby lizards or whatever they are. And she takes them into the ocean and they're all swimming. And Richard Attenborough there with his, with his melting face is like, the T-Rex was a fantastic swimmer. It could get in the water and swim for hours and hours. And I'm like, wait a minute. How do you know if the T-Rex could swim? Have you ever, did they ever find a T-Rex skeleton at the bottom of the ocean? You, I mean, they're pretty clunky looking animals. If you're like 90 feet tall and most of you is leg and your arms are like, you know, the size of Kentucky Fried Chicken chicken wings, are you really going to want to go into the ocean and swim and this is what you're using to, you know, yeah, the legs are going to propel you along, but you really, these are what I call drowning arms. These do do not look like uh, Olympic gold medal swimming arms. These... These look like instant, you're sinking to the bottom when you're a giant T-Rex. 
Oh, but the majestic T-Rex could swim for miles and miles through the frothing waves to get to islands where it would hunt with its children. Yeah, I don't know that... First of all, you're living on planet Earth, T-Rex. You've got no barriers, no obstructions to the whole planet. No mankind exists yet. So you got no predators, you got no obstacles. Why do you got to go to the damn island? Why do you got to swim to an island? What's that, your idea of going to McDonald's? Come on, kids, we're going to the island tonight. It's a special treat. Daddy got a raise today. Let's swim to the island for the all-you-can-eat buffet. No. So anyway, so then, then they go on more and they elaborate and they, 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 they you know, the Richard Attenborough, whatever his name is, he, he, he's still going off his script. He's like, and the baby T-Rexes, it was very rare for more than three of the whole clutch to make it through their first year. Out of 12 T-Rex pups, only three would make it to maturity. And as they walked across the glacier, that's the other thing. This guy picks his word. It's glacier, you melting British sponge cake. If I hear that guy say the glacier one more time, or the sloth, the three-toed sloth crawled across the glacier. No. Hey, 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 yeasty. It's the three-toed sloth crawled across the glacier. You British roast beef, Yorkshire pudding sucking, gravy licking puffball. So anyways, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, here, here he is rifling off these statistics about the mortality rate of young T-Rexes. And I'm like, how, pardon my French, how the fuck do you know? How did it, 400 million years ago, and somehow you know the mortality rate of, of the, uh, the T Rex uh, kids, and somehow you know a giant T Rex was a, an excellent swimmer? Hey, uh, broccoli ass, we don't even know who shot JFK. We don't even know who really built the pyramids or how they were done. And that was like, what, two, 3,000 years ago? And somehow you have the uh, exact statistics on the uh, survival rate of uh, T-Rex babies from 400 million years ago? I mean, come on, man. Why not just make up some more shit? The T-Rex on Saturday afternoons like to lay on his back and suntan up on the top of volcanoes. And then, to cool his reptilian body, he would take his children, only the ones that have survived, and slide down the icy glacier and smash into the sloths waiting at the bottom, using them like hairy, retarded bowling pins. Come on. I'm just, I'm not having it, man. It's one thing if you want to do the animation and recreate, but don't start telling me what these animals did and what they looked like. And, and, and even with the CGI, you may think you have the exterior. You may think you have what they looked like. Maybe they were scaly. Maybe they had bumpy skin. Maybe they had feathers. You weren't there. For all they know, for all we know, dinosaurs could have had some type of exterior coat that was something we don't even know exists. They went extinct. We have no real flesh and blood record of these critters. I mean, for all we know, their exoskin could have been glass or plexiglass or, or fiberglass or it could have been made of wheat. Or it could have been uh, made of uh, something we don't even know exists. It could have been running liquid uh, wingle wongle badungle flongle. And we know that doesn't exist. Um, So anyways, man, 
it's like I'm all for like kind of reenacting and pretending that we can peek back in time and 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 kind of imagine what everything looked like and how they moved, but but let's not start rifling off statistics and pseudo scientific facts. You don't know. It's just uh, it's 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 a little bit annoying from that perspective, but um, it is fascinating and uh, it is really cool, and uh, it, it's funny too because you you look at a show about dinosaurs, and they try to talk about all these things, but if you think about it, with dinosaurs, all they can kind of fabricate and elaborate on is based on the fossil evidence that has been discovered that has been found. So let's say we took every fossilized dinosaur species that they have and put them on a list. I don't know, how long is that list? Maybe three, four hundred dinosaurs? I mean, how many can you think about off the top of your head? The Stegosaurus, the Allosaurus, the T-Rex, the Brontosaurus, the Paleosaurus? You know, there, there's there's a list, but that's just from the bones and remains we found from four, five, six hundred million years ago, right? So think about all the living organisms that exist in today's world, from ants to seashells to birds to insects to mammals to and amphibians to reptiles. Like, the, we have millions of species. And, by the way, mankind's eradicated thousands of them already. But, so imagine way back then, 400 million years ago, when there was no interference by man, we have to assume there was probably millions of species back then. But then cut to the list of what we know, or what we think we know, maybe three, four, five hundred species of recovered dinosaur and, and look how fantastical those are with the giant heads and the fangs and the claws and they're higher than an apartment building and they're, they're longer than a, 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 a cruise ship. But what about all the millions of species over the decades and over the centuries that didn't leave any fossilized remains? Can you imagine the plethora of creatures that we can't even imagine because there's no way to even know what they were or know that they existed. Maybe maybe there was a, a centipede that was a mile long. Maybe there was another dinosaur that was five times higher than a brontosaurus. Maybe there was a, a fish in the sea that was, uh, you know, the length of a football field. Who knows? But that's what's fascinating about it. So I do appreciate... I do appreciate them doing this kind of reenactment, but you, you got to wonder too, with kids watching this stuff now that is so real, like you picture a six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kid watching this dinosaur thing with this immaculate CGI, and I could see the kid just turning to the parent and going, oh, where, where is that? Can we go there? I, I want to see those. And you're like, well, what are you talking about, Billy? I, I want to go there. I want to go where the where the Dilapidons are running around and the Triceratops. I want to go there. Oh, uh, well, that's not real, Billy. What do you mean? It sure is real. I can see it. Well, Billy, that, no, it's not. It is so, and I want to go, or I'm going to eat the couch. So, entering into this weird, weird uh, world. But anyway, speaking of weird stuff, let's take a little break, and uh, I want to show you uh, this week's hand-drawn Harland uh, Williams custom T-shirts. As you know, I draw my own T-shirts, and every week I like to show them to you just so you can see what I've been up to creatively. So uh, let's throw to that, and we'll be right back after we look at my T-shirts. Oh yeah, here we go. Time for another hand-drawn shirt by yours truly. And if you don't know, 
I draw my own t-shirts. I take Sharpie markers and I draw directly on the t-shirt. And if this shirt's still available, you can own it at harbling.com. So let's go ahead and reveal this week's hand-drawn Harlan t-shirt. All right, here's this week's hand-drawn t-shirts by yours truly. And this first one is my depiction of Elon Musk ox. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a musk ox, but they're a, a large, hairy, hoofed mammal that live out in the uh, Arctic, in the snow and the tundra, and they have a, a rack of uh, horns or antlers on their head that looks like a, kind of like a shell with points on the end. So I decided to combine Elon Musk with a musk ox, and there's Elon Musk ox. And then over here, I don't know who this guy is, but if you look at the smoke curling up from his cigarette, it spells the word loser. <laughs> and for some reason, I just hate this guy. Like I drew him and I thought he's like kind of the pretentious artsy fartsy loser that I, I see sometimes walking the street, just kind of trendy and I don't know, poor guy. I just labeled him a loser, so. You got the loser and you got Elon Musk ox. These are available at harbling.com. My t-shirt website, I hand draw these myself. And if they're not available, you can always buy a print at harbling.com. Well, we are back and uh, I forgot to mention little Coco's here today, co-hosting. And uh, he's got a very handsome hat on today. Very, very Frank Sinatra, little Coco. Little Coco. Uh, little Coco talking to you. Okay, ass. I was just saying I like your little hat. Nothing. Okay. Anyways, um... Let's speaking of quiet introvert, you know, I think we all experience um, moments of of just being with ourselves and being quiet. And I think that happened a lot during uh, COVID. I think, you know, we were all, all of us just kind of cooped up with ourselves, especially if you were single and you lived alone. You didn't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a wife or family. Like for millions and millions of people, myself included, um, we had to spend a lot of time just with ourselves. Um, and when you're alone with yourself as a human being, you get very uh, introspective. You get reflective. You have a lot of time to examine yourself and think about yourself. Because you don't have a lot of uh, external stimuli. You don't have other people to bounce off of. And uh, and sometimes when we are in a place where we're alone for too long, we start to really find out about ourselves. And sometimes we find out things about ourselves that maybe we didn't know or maybe even something we don't like. And... Uh, I had an experience I can't forget. I'll share it with you. There was there was kind of a beat not too long ago where I was getting kind of cabin fever, you know, and everyone's still sort of socially distancing. So it, it's still a bit weird. And I, I, I was just kind of feeling a little bit like closed in. You know what I mean? And I thought to myself, man, I, I got to get out. I, I got to get out of the city I just got to clear my head. I just, daddy's got to fly, right? Daddy's got to move. So here's what I did. And uh, it was very interesting. I discovered something about myself that I did not know. And I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I was getting the cabin fever. And I'm like, I, I just got to get out and breathe, right? So I went down into the backyard. And you know what I have in my backyard. Let's not pretend you don't know what I have in my backyard. You know what I got. I got an old wooden tool shed like most of us do. An old wooden shack over in the corner of the yard. And I go back there and I have my Birkenstock sandals that I bought at Lilith Fair. And I boot the door in. I just, I get the, I get the Lilith Fair 
Birkenstocks, and I just kick the door in, right? Boom, doors fly open, and you can see the, the sunbeams coming through the cracks in the wood and little particles of dust floating around in the sunbeams. And then over in the corner, over in the corner, my old wooden shed under, a, under an old dusty tarpaulin, an old dusty tarpaulin, I, I go over and I, I grab the tarp, right? I grab the tarpaulin right by the edges and I just, I just pull it. I'm like, you know, just one of those swooping motions, like, like David Copperfield ripping off Donny Osmond's G-string at an all-night Kenny G raver right? And what's under my old dusty tarpaulin? I think you know. A 1962 midnight blue Corvette Stingray. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You drooling yet? And Daddy gets this thing out on the road. I get it out. I roll it out. I start it up. I get it out on the road. And I just start to ride. I get out on the highway. I got this thing on the highway. I'm I'm, I'm over here on the trans, uh, transgender highway. And I'm just flying, right? I'm, 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 I've got my pedal to the metal. I got my foot to the metal because daddy likes to ride hot. And I see the city in the rearview mirrors melting away behind me. And I'm, I'm flying down the highway in this 1973 sunflower yellow Dodge Charger. And before long, before you know it, I'm, I'm where I want to be. And suddenly I'm out in the country, right? I'm out in the countryside. I'm, I'm rolling along. And the, now I've got rolling hills and green pastures. And it's beautiful, man. And what do I see? You know what I see out there in, in, the, in the country. We've all been to the country. It wasn't long till I saw it. There they were, a field full of cows. A beautiful field full of cows, those big docile creatures with the black and white spots. And there was like 30, 40 beautiful cows. Even the little ones were there, the little cows, the, the veals. And I think some of them were breaded. I think a few of them were breaded veals. And, and I was just like, wow, look at those docile, beautiful creatures. And I, and I decided to pull my, my wheels over to the side, right? And I did one of these. I did like the truck driver, put my hand on the steering wheel, and I, I guided that 1984 Prius, gray Prius to the side. And there they were, the cows, and I... I stepped out of the Prius and the sun was shining down. And I, I don't know why, but I just, I felt free. I felt wild. I ripped my shirt off, standing in the sun, shirtless. My, my six pack, the, the sections of my six pack undulating, moving up and down like two monarch butterfly caterpillars climbing up the inner thigh of Weird Al Yankovic's pasty white legs. And I turn and I see those cows and I walk over and I'm shirtless and I, and I lean on the barbed wire, right? Just with my bare arm. I'm, Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm, that's what Jesus would do. I just lean on, on the barbed wire and I'm looking at these, these cows and I don't know what happened. This is what I'm talking about. Sometimes you discover things about yourself. You don't know, you don't like. And I don't know what happened. I'm watching these gentle, docile creatures out in the field, grazing, minding their business, just at, at peace, at harmony with the world. And I guess all the anxiety of being cooped up just came f- frothed out of me. And I feel horrible, but for some reason, I started lighting the cows up. I started uh, verbally abusing them. I started yelling at them, but and, and to make it worse, I broke into an Irish accent. I was like, hey, there you fat fucks. Hey, you fat fucks, you black and white speckled fucks, yeah. Hey, just standing in the fucking field all day, eating the fucking grass, shitting all over the place, squirting your milk everywhere. Ah, you fat fucks, yeah. And in that moment, in that horrible, horrible moment, 
I realized right then and there as I yelled at those poor innocent cows, I realized, my God, I'm lactose intolerant. I, 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 I had no tolerance for those milk squirting slobs. And I, I, I didn't know I was lactose intolerant, but now I do. And like I said, that can be the pain of getting in touch with yourself and getting to know yourself real well. So I've got some amending to do. I've got some making up to do. Maybe I'll sneak into a cow field one of these nights and just pet the little milk squirters and calm them and hold them, hug them and maybe spoon them through the night, just lay them gently down on the grass and put my arms around them and spoon them naked, making little calf noise. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to be tolerant. Yeah. You know, this type of thing. I just I'm a healer. I like to heal. All right, and if that wasn't mental enough, and by the way, that really happened. That's a real story. Uh, as if that wasn't mental enough, I think uh, we should end the show off with a even crazier story. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, let's throw to the Harlan Highway crazy news story. The Harlan Highway crazy news story. That's weird. Wow. What strange stuff. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, 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 okay. Okay, let's put them on. Let's put on the uh, I Dream of Genie Peepers. I don't even know why I called them that, but I did. That's the theme from I Dream of Genie. And this is the Harland Highway podcast. It's not... Your highway podcast. So if I want to do the theme for my dream of genie, let's see you stop me. Let's see me. Let's see you stop me. You mushroom soup slurping, crouton dipping, uh, French fry, curly fry, crinkle cut fry sucking uh, freaks. Dun 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 dun. dun. Have I lost you? Come back. Come back. We're going to do the crazy. I apologize. I apologize. Let's let's do the crazy news story. Here's the headline. And uh, what is wrong with people? Here's the headline for today's crazy news story. Man in wig throws cake at the Mona Lisa. You know the famous Leonardo da Vinci painting of the Mona Lisa or the Mona Lisa? Depends how you want to say it. Mona, Mona, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Richard Gere, Richard Greer. Maryland, Maryland, whatever. Um, So this happened in Paris where the Mona Lisa resides. Uh, And here we go. A man seemingly disguised as an old woman in a wheelchair threw a piece of cake at the Mona Lisa at the Louvre Louvre Museum in Paris and shouted at people to think of planet Earth. The Paris prosecutor's office said Monday that the 36-year-old man was detained following Sunday's incident and sent to a police psychiatric unit. An investigation has been opened into the damage of cultural artifacts. Videos posted on social media showed a young man in a wig and lipstick who had arrived in a wheelchair. The man whose identity was unknown was also seen throwing roses in the museum Uh, in front of slack-jawed guests. 
the cake attack, and where, how often do you hear that nowadays? You know, we get Al-Qaeda, we get ISIS, we get school shootings, we get bombings, we get, and we get a cake attack. This sounds like uh, someone getting in a fight at a Jenny Craig or something like that. Um, so this guy, this guy uh, attacked the Mona Lisa and left a conspicuous white creamy smear on the glass that protects the Leonardo da Vinci painting. Security guards were filmed escorting the wig-wearing man as he called out to the surprised visitors in the gallery, Think of Earth! There are people who are destroying the Earth! Think about it! Artist tells you, think of the Earth! That's why I did this! Okay, wig, wheelchair, lipstick guy lady. The guards were then filmed cleaning the cake from the glass. A Louvre statement confirmed the attack on the artwork involving a pastry. So it was a pastry attack. Um, And uh, this painting, in case you didn't know, is over 500 years old. And it's been attacked before. Um, It was damaged during an acid attack in the 1950s. Uh, There was a woman, a Russian woman, who was angry at uh, France for not giving her French citizenship, so she threw a ceramic teacup at the painting. I think it was shot at at one point in time. So, uh, good Lord. The the, the idea that this guy, like, put on a costume and got a wheelchair and, and put on a wig and lipstick, it was almost like Norman Bates' mother rolling into the the Lirev and and attacking something with a piece of cake. Norman, I don't like that painting, Norman. I'm going to smear a hostess ho-ho all over that painting, Norman. Come here, Norman. Mother wants you to rub a Swiss roll on the Mona Lisa, Norman. I mean, this is just ridiculous. And I don't know if any of you have seen the Mona Lisa. I've seen it. I've, I've been uh, to, I saw it actually, I think it was in London, England. It was on loan to the, uh, the uh, British Art Gallery there, right in London. And I had the opportunity to see this, uh, this miraculous painting in real life. Although I don't even know why I'm calling it miraculous. I'm a little kind of befuddled by the Mona Lisa. I I recognize that it's a portrait of a simple-looking woman with kind of a plain half-smile. But I'm not entirely sure why this particular painting has enchanted the world uh, since it was kind of created. Over 500 years, it's considered an art classic. And it's funny because this is the contention I have with the art world is I feel like from a very early age, we are kind of told what great art is. If you go into any major art gallery in any major city, it's the Van Goghs, it's the Da Vinci's, it's the Goya's, it's the Dali's, it's, it's the uh, Rembrandt's. It's the Renoirs. It's it's all the uh, you know all the masters, right? And so, our generation and the next generation and the next generation, they're all going to be fed that these are the master artworks. And I think the the real the real place in in the art world is is the the art form that they inspired or created, like cube, cubism or realism or, uh, you know, Dutch uh, dingle-dongle or whatever, all the, all the different art movements that, uh, that transpired. I, th- I think, you know, all these, these classics help show the, the steps that art has taken through, through the centuries. But I do find it interesting that every generation of, of humans that comes along is kind of spoon-fed that these, this is art. 
This is this is uh, this is what art looks like. These 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 are the great paintings, and it's strange because when you think of the millions and millions of paintings that have been done by very talented artistic people over the history of civilized man, I always found it very kind of absurd that there's just this small collection of art that we just keep regurgitating to new generations of humans and saying, this is art. This is what we hang in the galleries. And so like a lot of things in our system, like our educational system and the, the institution of marriage and many other things, I, th- I think a lot of things could be updated and modernized and changed, but some of these things, we just seem stuck in it. So so anyways, I remember I went to see the Mona Lisa. And I was with my buddy, my buddy Bob. And, uh, you know, the, these art galleries are very prim and proper. And there's security guards everywhere. And there's a real stuffiness. And almost a little bit of pretentiousness to a lot of these big art galleries. And it's like, oh, you are, you are in the presence of art. Please behave accordingly. Please absorb it and analyze it and interpret the art. And so I decided, you know, I was over in London and, and I said to my buddy Bob, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to act like the, the American tourist that people hate. You know, like the, the, sometimes Americans get that kind of uh, stereotypical, the big kind of dumbass American tourist. And it's not true that that type of, tourist exists in any culture but for some reason the american got stigmatized with with the whole i'm just a dumb old american tourist which isn't fair at all but nonetheless so i decided to mess with the security guard at the uh the art gallery of london there and i was standing there and my buddy bob was with me and and believe it or not there were hardly any people around us and uh, I said to the guy, I said, I said, oh, I did kind of a southern accent just to add to it. I said, hey, is that, what's that paint in there? And I don't know word for word what the guy said, but the, the immediately you could see the hairs go up on, on the security guy. He was like an older British guy, had the uniform on, almost looked like a cop. It's like, well, that, that, is the, that is the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And I said, oh, okay, cool. Uh, well, um, how much is it? And he's like, I beg your pardon, sir. I said, well, how much is it? I kind of like it. He said, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not for sale. I said, well, I, well, I'd like to buy it. I mean, what, what, I, mean, what I, I got two, $3,000. Would that get me that thing? He's like, I'm afraid it's not for sale. He was just like incensed. And me and my buddy Bob are trying to hold in our laughter. And I just kept, well, I'd, I'd like to, you know, is, can, can we take it down? I'd like to look at it up close and just to kind of touch it and just kind of see if I really want it, see if it's worth the $2,000. And he was just like, I'm afraid you should go somewhere else to buy your or something like that. He was just totally incensed. So we had a good laugh. And then we drop kicked the Mona Lisa, shot it, threw yogurt all over it, uh, took a flamethrower to it, uh, box-cutted it right across the face, and uh, soaked it in pomegranate juice. No, we didn't. We didn't. But we wanted to, because that's that smug Mona Lisa face where she's just like... It's almost like she's she's taunting you, right? She's, it's almost like she she's inviting you to assault her. She's got that real kind of like, like she just won a, a big argument. Like you were a married couple and she won a big argument and now she's just gloating. She's just there with that half smile and those, those half drooped eyes. She's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, looks like I won again, loser. Mm-hmm. And you wonder why people want to put their fists through her or the shooter or burn her or rub cake on her or it's just like cocky she's a cocky and she's got it coming someone's gonna get you mona lisa your days are numbered you smug cocky 
half man, half woman, whatever you are. And I'm just getting angry. Just getting angry. And that's not what we want to do here at the Harland Highway. I already, I already am lactose intolerant. I don't want to be Mona Lisa intolerant. So let's wrap it up. Let's close the door. And before we go, can I please remind you and ask you humbly to subscribe to the Harland Highway podcast. There's a little button over here on the left. You can see it right in the corner, right over there, a little subscribe button. If you hit that, it gets bigger and you hit subscribe or there might be one down below on your YouTube page. And uh, it would be so helpful if you guys could subscribe and recommend the podcast to your friends because the more we can build this up, the more I can do it and the more guests I can get and the more fun we can have and the more we can kick the Mona Lisa right in the face. Um, and uh, also don't forget if you uh, want uh, some bonus material, um, join my Patreon page. Ooh, I just, I just did a little seven up burpee. Excuse me. Um, please join my Patreon page. And when I can, when, it, when I get things edited in time, what I did for the first time is I pre-posted the Harland Highway podcast for my Patreon members. So in other words, they saw the, the next podcast about four or five days before you did. And don't get pissed off at me, but that's just one of the perks you get when you join my Patreon page. It's $5 a month. And you get, uh, you get bonus material, get some of the uh, audio uh, skits that I, I used to do on the old podcast with some of my characters, Aunt Ruthie and George Michael and all kinds of fun characters. You get to see uh, a sneak preview of my artwork and my t-shirts before everyone else does. You get goofy video skits, all kinds of stuff. So if you want to uh, jump on the Patreon and get all that bonus stuff, just go to... Uh, Google and type in Harlan Williams Patreon and uh, you can enjoy that. And then as I told you last podcast, I'm doing this thing called Cameo where you can order up your very own custom video from yours truly. And I can do a video for you for your birthday or for Father's Day or Mother's Day or Valentine's Day or any type of event or moment in your life where you want might want me to do a personal, funny, silly uh, video for you. So just go to uh, Cameo, cameo cameo.com, and type in my name and uh, just uh, send it off and we'll get it to you. In some cases, for a little extra money, you can get 24-hour service where I can get the video shot off to you within 24 hours uh, if you really, really need it uh, for a specific time frame. So check that out. And again, please tell your friends uh, to get on the Harland Highway and subscribe. And uh, we'll just keep bringing this uh, this fun stuff to you. We'll try and keep it even more real than CGI. Um, Yeah. More real than CGI. Hello, brontosaurus breasts. Uh, so that's it for today. Hope you had a groovy, groovalicious time. There's that word again. We brought it all the way back around. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for being here. And until next time, everybody, chicken chow mein, baby.